So a quick word about Juvi. He's a guy who cares and works for your security even more than your own mother's. And he also rides mountain bikes, and you can either meet him at the back end or at the mountain end. Uh, so give him a warm welcome, please. Juvi. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Uh, can everyone hear me? OK, good. Thank you. So today, we are going to talk about money. And money is a very important concept in our world. Basically, everything we do in our lives uh, somehow is related to money. <coughs> but before we uh, start with the actual uh, presentation, I'll tell you a few things about myself. <coughs> so, uh, I've been married for 15 years. Um, <coughs> and I've been married to Java for 15 years. <coughs> Okay, I have to say, uh, I have not been entirely faithful to this programming language. <clears throat> but anyway, uh, so what do I use uh, Java for? Uh, I'm leading a company which uh, provides identity provision uh, based on OpenID Connect and OAuth. These are two protocols um, for identity provision, authorization stuff, which uh, Bozo basically briefly mentioned in the previous lecture. And it is a very lean company which takes care of about 1% of the world population. So what else can, can I tell you about myself? I'm also involved with the Plovdi hacker space. Uh, is there anyone here who is from the hacker fair, from the Plovdi hacker space? Yeah, that's Value. He's one of the guys who helped us uh, <coughs> found this wonderful place. So whenever you come to Plovdiv, uh, feel uh, free to uh, visit us. <coughs> so what are the hashtags of Hackafe? I like. <coughs> this is a very Blobdiv thing. And the other thing, the other hashtag, of course, minor. <coughs> All right. So we're going to talk about money. <coughs> and a lot of people have uh, preconceptions about money. Where does it come from? And I recently, recently tried doing a Google search about money. <coughs> and these are the suggestions I got. <coughs> and according to a survey, which was done a couple of months ago in Switzerland, approximately 73% of the people do not know where money actually comes from. So my uh, hope is that we'll be able to uh, remove this mystery in the next couple of minutes. And to do that, uh, we will play a game. <coughs> we'll play a game of money. <coughs> OK. So what does this game involve? It has a very um, simple set of rules. The leading rule is that uh, people trade with one another. And in order to trade with one another, uh, they use money for that. <coughs> so essentially, money becomes uh, a medium of exchange. <coughs> and the very significant rule in this game is that whenever you need to trade with somebody and you need money for that, this money or these uh, units of exchange, they need to be borrowed. <coughs> and we'll have a look at how this happens. So basically, uh, we have three entities in this game. Uh, on the left-hand side is the central bank. <coughs> this is a very special uh, bank which is created solely for the purpose of seeding or creating initial b money, which then is injected into the commercial banks. These commercial banks are basically the banks you're dealing with on a daily basis. So whenever you go uh, to a high street bank uh, to open up a bank account or let's say apply for a mortgage for your house, you'll be dealing with the commercial banks. And you or we guys, we are on the right hand side. This is the economy, these are the people who actually need money in order to transact with, an, with one another, uh, in order to make deposits, take credit. 
So the commercial banks, they act as an intermediary between a central bank, which is typically controlled by the government, and the economy, the people. Right. So, what are the roles in this game? <coughs> uh, we have the central banker. Uh, this is basically the guy uh, who takes care of uh, monetary policy. What does this say? Basically, the central banker determines uh, the seed amount of money that is injected into the commercial banks. And one of his primary jobs is to keep inflation at a fairly steady uh, rate, which is about 2%. <coughs> uh, so we have three bankers to choose in this game, uh, Ben, Mario and Ivan. I'll give you uh, a hint, if you choose Ivan, uh, your salary will be a state secret. <laughs> right. Then we have another role, which is the boss of the private bank. Uh, don't, don't choose Tetsu, please. <laughs> right. Um, so their role is basically uh, to manage a private bank institution. And the way profit is generated is typically by, uh, okay, various things, but a principal way of making profit is by uh, issuing debt or credit and collecting interest on that. Then, of course, banks also charge us for things like uh, performing transactions payments. Unfortunately, when things go bad, uh, governments have to step in and bail out uh, the bank. And row three, well, that's the economy. Uh, so here in our game, the economy is composed of Alice, Bob, and Claire. And their job is to take on debt or credit and <laughs> pay it back with interest. Right, so are we ready to start a game? Good. <clears throat> so let's start a game. And this is a scenario which, which is simplified, but it resembles uh, the workings of the financial um, markets and the economy as a whole. Uh, Fairly, I mean, fair, uh, fairly, um, fairly correctly. I mean, you can. Uh, these rules are fairly um, common in what's happening. So let's start one uh, game. So over here we have the central bank, uh, which creates hundred dollars as credit and provides them at a five percent interest to the commercial banks which are in the middle and they act as an intermediary in our transactions. Uh, you can follow the totals here at this corner. So then these $100, uh, they become an asset of the commercial banks. So what do commercial banks do with this money? Uh, they typically lend it. Uh, over here you can see that uh, the central the commercial bank now has $100 that it got from the central bank, but it actually owes 105 because it has to repay this interest of 5%, which for $100 uh, adds up to $5. Then this money gets into the economy. And in this particular scenario, the way the money gets in is by Alice borrowing $100 with a 10% interest to buy a house from Bob the Builder. Right. Uh, Bob provides the house to Alice and he has $100. What does he do with the $100? Uh, he's going to put it in a safe place. So he's going to put it in a bank deposit with a commercial bank. So what happens now, the commercial bank has got these hundred dollars again. And what, what is the logical thing to do with this money if you want to generate profit? Sorry? Yes, exactly. So Claire, which is our third player down there, she also needs a house. And she buys a house for hundred dollars from Bob the Builder, for which she takes a loan for hundred dollars with 10% interest. And Bob 
oh, he has another hundred dollars, so what is he going to do with his money? He's going to put it back into his bank account. So the central bank, the commercial bank, sorry, has again hundred dollars. So at this point, let's stop the game and analyze what has happened. So we have a look at the economy. And down there we can see uh, how the money uh, has changed. Basically, we, we had this initial $100, which were created by the central bank. If we ask Bob, Bob, how much money do you have in the bank as a deposit? He'll tell you, I have $200, because I sold two houses for $100 each. And if we ask Alice and Claire, okay, how much money do we, you guys owe? Uh, should, they'll tell you we owed together $220. And at this point, we realize, okay, if we calculate the balance between what is uh, available as money, as deposits within the commercial banks, and what the players in the economy owe them, we'll see that we have a negative balance of $20. And if we think about it, uh, these guys, Claire and Alice, they have to return this money. But no matter how, how they trade among each other, that is Alice, Bob and Claire, uh, they cannot possibly repay this $20 because it does not exist, this amount of money does not exist in the economy. And the only way under these rules for them to get this money in order to repay the debt that they have is to borrow again new units of exchange from the bank. What would essentially uh, sink them deep, deeper into debt. Or the other alternative is for somebody to get, to become bankrupt or insolvent. So this is essentially the game. And if we take this game on and fast forward it to present time, 2015, uh, we'll, we'll see the facts. Uh, this is a survey of the consulting uh, company McKinsey, which I came across a couple of months ago. And they have tried to calculate the total amount of money which is available in the world economy, and also to add up the total debt that is owed by governments, private individuals, households, businesses to banks. So the total money which is available in the economy adds up to almost $80 trillion. And the money that they owe to banks adds up to about $200 trillion. Which means that there is a $120 trillion gap between money which is available and much money which has to be repaid. And according to these rules of the game, in order to repay this money, uh, the players in the economy, they need to take on further debt. At which point we ask ourselves, okay, is this sustainable? And how much is actually $120 trillion? This is $120,000 billion. If you compare this to Bulgarian GDP, which I think amounts to about maybe $60 billion a year, less, all right, yeah, but we are IT guys, we will bring this up <laughs> in, a, in a few years. This is actually quite a lot of money. And if you think about it, this is actually quite, worth, quite bad, I mean, even if you compare it to uh, Game of Thrones, which is quite cruel. So essentially, this is the system effect, if you think about it, this is the system effect uh, when the units of exchange in an economy need to be borrowed from an entity at an interest. And to demonstrate to you just how ridiculous this is, I'll just give you another example. This is Todor, he's our central banker. You're welcome to come on stage. Uh, of, of these three bankers, which one would you like to play? Central banker, of course. Okay, great. <laughs> okay, so we have, uh, we have this economy which um, runs on Clubmate. Have you tried this drink? Yeah, okay. 
So this economy is based on people producing and consuming ClubMate. But the only problem we have is that in order to trade with ClubMate, uh, we need to have bottles, right? Because without bottles, there's no way to trade. But the, but the way the system is set up, in order to uh, trade with ClubMate, we need to borrow bottles from the central bank. And he gives us, what? Four times five, 20 bottles. But the thing is, once we are finished, at the end of the year, we have to return 21 bottles. And what is the problem here? Do you realize what the problem is? This one bottle that, is, that we owe the bank as an interest does not exist in the economy. So what happens then? Uh, we have to borrow this uh, additional bottle again, for which we will again owe interest. This is just an illustration to, to show you guys how the system essentially works. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Oh, let me just leave it here. Okay, thank you. Uh, another side effect of this setup is that the money which is created by the central banks gets injected not directly into the economy, but it gets provided through the uh, financial industry. And the financial industry, this is basically a conglomerate of commercial banks, investment banks, uh, companies that trade with stock, uh, hedge funds, etc. And this is um, this diagram basically shows um, the amount of money that is exchanged every day. And what we have down there at the bottom is the money that is exchanged in the real economy for things like, you know, people producing and consuming clubmate, for instance or you guys buying computers or providing IT services. And you can see that this uh, trade gradually increases over the years. And it's a fairly uh, gradual increase, um, which happens organically. And the growth rate is, at the world growth rate is at about a couple of percent, maybe three, four, five percent, not more. What you see uh, in the red area is the amount, daily amount of money which gets circulated or traded in the financial markets. Uh, which, I mean, it's a disproportionate amount compared to what is exchanged in the real economy. So if on a single day uh, we exchange, let's say, maybe about $100 billion in the real economy, in the financial markets, the amounts are maybe 20, 30, or or 40 times more. So can you imagine this amount of money, maybe approximately $3.5 trillion get exchanged in the financial economy every day. And this is money that is exchanged uh, with stock trading, uh, foreign exchange. A foreign exchange is, is essentially when you buy and sell currency. Let's say I buy uh, euro, uh, uh, and sell uh, dollars, for instance. And do you know, can you guys, uh, do you guys have an idea why this dip occurred in 98, this dip? Basically, the reason this dip happened is that in 98 or 99, the European single currency was introduced. So this suddenly removed a basket of about 12 currencies from uh, from circulation. So the financial markets had 12 fewer currencies to play with. And they needed another, let's say, couple of years uh, to come up with additional uh, ways to generate these trades. Like derivatives, another thing that has picked up a lot recently is high-speed algorithmic trading, which is Computers running special algorithms for buying or selling stock, which are connected by optical fiber to the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange. And these uh, algorithms essentially do all this training, trading, and they can do that many times in a second. And the amounts of money are huge that are being um, the change hands, hands there. Another thing is insurance. Um, 
So this essentially creates a two-loop economy. Um, and because uh, the guys who run these financial companies, they have direct access to money at a much cheaper interest rate from the central banks. Um, they, have, they typically have a lot more power than we, because if we need to borrow this amount of money, we have to go to the commercial banks where interest rate is much higher. And some of you were here yesterday uh, when Arau told us about these 85 guys who own 50% uh, of the world economy. So these are probably guys who work here. And you might say, okay, this is a two, two loop economy. What does this matter to us? Um, there are many systemic problems. For instance, these huge amounts of money, once they get, for some reason, directed into the real economy, they can create huge bubbles. One such bubble, for instance, is a property bubble, which occurred even here in Bulgaria about 10 years ago, and from which we haven't quite recovered yet. I also think that our present bubble with um, our, this present, how to say, um, movement you know, to invest in new ice technology, that this part of this money is also fueled, fueled through these mechanisms. So now let's, let's talk about Bitcoin. Uh, are there any fans of Bitcoin here in, in, yeah. Oh, I can see plenty of hands rise. Yeah. So with Bitcoin, essentially we have units of exchange which are mined. And this happens by searching for hash collisions. And miners seek profit by uh, discovering Bitcoins, a new Bitcoin, which then they can then use to, uh, to finance some kind of a tra transaction or purchase. Um, if we think about Bitcoin, I mean, uh, the biggest problem with Bitcoin uh, from a systemic point of view is not, for instance, the amount of electricity that gets consumed. Um, some guys actually decided to make an estimate of how much power, electrical power, is currently being consumed to mine bitcoins. Uh, they arrived at this figure, which is between two terawatts of power per hour, which is a very optimistic scenario if you use uh, ASICs, which are very power efficient, up to 40 gigawatts of power. And if we compare that to the Bulgarian nuclear power station at Kosovo Dui, uh, it has only about 3.5 gigawatts of peak power. So this huge amount of electricity that is being consumed just to, to mine coins. But what is, what is the system limitation of Bitcoin? Because if, if, let's say, I've heard arguments, why don't we make uh, Bitcoin uh, a currency which is used by many people? What is the system limitation? This, is, this has to do with the supply of Bitcoin, which is limited by its algorithm. That is, the algorithm puts uh, a limit, a hard limit, on how many coins you can create. And there is no mechanism to adjust the amount of bitcoins in circulation according to the volume of traded goods and services. And why is this good? Why is this important? Uh, this is important for something we call price stability. So what is price stability? Uh, and how is it achieved? Uh, price stability is achieved by having a balance between the total amount of money which is circulated or used to the total value of goods and, tr and services which are traded in the economy, which for a country is called the GDP. If we have too much money, what will happen then? We have rising prices because there will be too much money chasing uh, the same amount of goods and services. We then have inflation. If we have if you don't have enough money, we'll have falling prices, which is the opposite of that, which is called deflation. And this, I'll go a slide back, makes, makes use of Bitcoin on a daily basis uh, rather unsuitable. 
It is fine for things like spot transactions, where you need to make an exchange, and let's say I want to send somebody money, I'll use the Bitcoin system, uh, I just see what the current price is, I buy a certain amount of Bitcoins, I, sell, I send this, this Bitcoins to my friend, and he then converts them to his own currency. But it wouldn't work for things like, let's say, uh, I hire our central banker, uh, and we decide to do business together, and we say, okay, for this amount of work, I will pay you 100 Bitcoin in, in a year. But given the way the price fluctuates, and because there is no mechanism that regulates the amount of circulation according to, to how much uh, goods and services are traded, we don't know how this price will look, at, look like in a year time. So either I will lose more money, or he will lose some money. So you don't know. So it's not, uh, Bitcoin has this fundamental problem. Right. So now we're going to talk about positive money. But before we talk about positive money, uh, we'll have a, we'll make a brief summary of the types of money that we looked at so far. So the first type of money we looked at is called uh, Okay, there are many names, but you can call it money as debt, where the units of exchange are borrowed at an interest. Like, let's say we need to, for our trade with uh, Clubmate, we need to borrow the additional bottles. Uh, the other currency we looked at is Bitcoin, where uh, the units of exchange are finite um, commodity. And now we're going to look at positive money. And how does positive money differ? Um, the fundamental difference is that the units of exchange under this system are granted to the economy. That is, you don't need to borrow this money at an interest. Instead, it is provided for free for use in the economy. But it is not provided arbitrary. It is provided to match GDP or the increase or demand of money inside the system. Uh, if you're interested about positive money, this is the, essentially the Bible, or a paper which describes in about 80 pages the fundamental concepts. And it is not a new concept. Um, as I said, the fundamental principle is that money, new money is granted, not borrowed at an interest. Um, the amount of money that is created under positive money is just is chosen to, to reflect the uh, growth of the economy. And this is to prevent bubbles, like property bubbles, for instance. And the intent is to um, make this process as simple, as transparent, and as democratic as possible. So how does the setup look under positive money? We basically have a committee. Uh, this can also actually also be uh, a, some kind of an algorithm which tracks parameters in the economy and determines the GDP, that is the, the value of the goods and services that are created and exchange hands. And based on this data, it rec makes a recommendation how much additional money we need to create in order to satisfy this balance between prices and money in circulation. It then sends an order to the central bank, please, uh, we need, let's say, another two billion dollars to maintain price stability. Then the central bank provides this amount of money to the government, which then uses an algorithm or some kind of a policy to inject this money into the economy. So let's look at this um, in more detail. So step one is to create new money. And as I just explained, uh, to create new money, we need to measure and keep track of GDP growth. Then the central bank creates the necessary amount to match projected increase. And if we take Bulgaria as an example, uh, the projected GDP for this year is 82 uh, billion less. Is this correct? Okay, now you don't know. <laughs> Good. Right. 
And our government has said that, that the projected growth is going to be 2%, which means that, thank you, which means that uh, we will require another 1.6 billion less to maintain balance. So once this money is created, we need to allocate it. And uh, now this is a matter of policy. That is, people in, in, in such a system, people of the, of the country, voters will decide how this money should be distributed, how should it be allocated. And these are some possible scenarios, like, for example, reduce taxes. So if we take this amount of money and use it to reduce taxes, everyone's taxes will go down by about 350 less. Alternatively, alternatively, we can use it to uh, increase government spending. For example, give the money to BB so we can have more motorways. <coughs> yeah, why not? <laughs> uh, we can also use it to uh, reduce government debt, or we can use it for something which is called citizen bonus or helicopter money. That is basically give everyone 350 lives at the end of the year, and then you decide how to do, what to do with it. But the idea is to let this up to people to decide how this money should be spent. Okay. Um, I have received questions. Yeah, but do we still have uh, commercial banks under the system? Yes, we do still have them. Um, and what their job is, the job is under the system is more or less the same. Uh, they will maintain our uh, transactional or payment or current accounts. So they will be running the payment system. And there will also be, as we have now, investment accounts. But the two accounts will be uh, strictly separated. That is, the money which, uh, in the, under the present system, banks used uh, to generate uh, new debt or credit would not be uh, allowed to be used in that way, as we saw under this game in the first couple of slides. <clears throat> and what are the benefits of positive money? Uh, okay, money creation tracks GDP, so we, we don't create more than it is necessary, which minimizes the chances of having property and other bubbles. Uh, the benefit of creating new money uh, accrues to the state, not to the commercial banks. Uh, this newly created money can then be spent directly to reduce taxes. Uh, the newly created money is no longer out to the banks. Uh, this also simplifies banking regulations. Because after the financial crisis, government decided that, okay, we want to prevent another financial crisis, but let's make the rules harder for banks, how they lend uh, money. Let's make it harder for banks to get into uh, riskier operations. And in the States, uh, they have created legislation which is about 8,000 pages thick. And if you're, pro if you're a programmer at such a bank, you know, this would be very hard to implement. And what happens then, this cost of complex regulations is essentially passed to us because it results in uh, increased fees for transactions, etc. So the idea of, another idea of positive money is to simplify regulations. Uh, another good side effect is that if a bank fails, it can be relatively safely wound down. Uh, so, we would not need to have this state deposit insurance as we have right now. If you remember last year, we had this KTB bank which failed. Uh, there was some deposit insurance, but it was not uh, sufficient, so we had to borrow additional funds. Uh, greater financial stability. Yes, how and tr how, how would this happen? Basically, through reduced leverage. That is. Uh, this use of as deposits as payment would not happen under the positive money system. And there will be a transition period which will allow the gradual re reduction of uh, government and private debt. And there are some uh, good issues. Okay, some people will say, okay, this is a good, good, uh, good news. You know, some bankers who contrib contributed to the crash in Iceland, they got uh, in jail, in prison. <coughs> Uh, the good news is that, like, is that countries uh, like small, uh, the small country Iceland, which suffered tremendously 
uh, in the crisis, uh, has decided to uh, investigate this proposal for sovereign money. And the Prime Minister of Iceland commissioned the Finance Minister to come up with this report, which I showed to you a few slides ago. I also uh, got news that uh, there was a um, the Swiss managed to collect a sufficient amount of signatures to uh, initiate a referendum on monetary reform. So these are all good news. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical that, uh, let's say, the European U Union or the states will uh, consider this uh, consider implementing this monetary system because the uh, policy is much more complicated. But small countries like Switzerland and Iceland can lead the way. And let's sum up the lessons. Money is a medium of exchange. Uh, the units of exchange should be provided for free to the economy in amounts that reflect its growth. And we've also learned that whoever creates controls creation and allocation of these units of exchange has real power. So that power had better be uh, for the benefit of the people and not the 1%. Thank you. <laughs> so how much, how much time do we have for questions now? Okay. Okay. okay, so we're ready for some questions, if you have any. Please line up at the microphones yeah, you can use, in use the central the mic. corridor. Yeah. Hello, do you have any idea of any country that's already using that system? And also the one that you showed, that we cannot uh, generate more bottles, and we need more bottles, and we have to borrow. Is there a country that is using different methods? Uh, there is no country there's no state that has implemented positive money yet. Uh, this is only a proposal which is currently being looked at in Iceland and people in Switzerland have gathered enough signatures to initiate a referendum on that, but nothing further than that has actually progressed. And, and uh, the idea of this lecture for me was to actually um, make people aware of this topic. Did, did I answer your question? Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Hello. Uh, well, this system is optimized for uh, growth only. So, w if we have decrease in economy, yes. uh, what is the mechanism of subtracting uh, money from the economy? Yeah. Okay. Uh, in order to have a balanced econ economy or system, you also have to take care of the situation when uh, the economy is slowing down, and to prevent uh, deflation or inflation, you have to um, destroy money or basically take money out. Uh, the way this can be done is by uh, reducing government spending. So get the government will spend less, and after that, this, this money that has been collected as taxes but is not used, has not been spent, can be destroyed. This is one way to do it. Yeah, but this is uh, a uh, standard mechanism uh, in current economy and it has, it's proven that <laughs> it's not working very well. Yeah, under, under the current economy, why, does, wh wh why is the effect as what we see? The problem is, if you've taken debt uh, and if you uh, remove money or you, if you decrease spending, you, know, you are less likely um, but basically, you, you actually, I'm not sure about that. Um, I, I think one of the problems of the current economy is that um, the, the central banks have produced a tremendous amount of money, which they're offering uh, at reduced interest rates. But in order to benefit from this money, because the idea is, okay, let's produce more money to kickstart uh, growth again. The problem is that many governments and companies and individuals are already deep into debt. So in order to take more credit, you need to have better credibility. But if you already owe oh, lots of money, this will be hard to do. Thank you. Okay, thank you too. Any other questions? Yes. Um, just a quick one. Uh, in the beginning you had a slide that showed uh, 
80 trillion dollars in circulation versus a 200 trillion debt or something yes. like that? Yes. Over what, over the course of how many years was that statistic uh, estimated? Well, this is just a, a snapshot of the, of the state, which was maybe at the end of 2014. So, so this is just a snapshot. It, is, it does not show the cumulative how things have changed. Yeah. Thank you. So okay. uh, another question. Please, uh, please. I'm sorry. Let's take the question from the front. Yeah. It was before you. The guys at the front want, want, also want to. Yeah. Okay. Uh, hey, sorry. Uh, so basically, what you're talking about is positive money is fixing the money system, the monetary system in general. I'm not saying I'm against that. I'm just wondering, isn't it? Pr uh, the same fix if we bind money to a common resource like gold as it was for the US dollar about 100 years ago, I believe. So basically, isn't it pretty much the same thing? Yeah, I understand. Uh, gold is a commodity. So essentially, with gold, you more or less get into the same situation as Bitcoin. That is, in order to increase money supply, you need to mine more gold. Yeah. Um, I personally think that having money which does not cost a fortune to create as units would be a better solution than using a commodity. And it could even be, okay, could, doesn't necessarily have to be a commodity like Bitcoin, which is, we can call it virtual, even a real world uh, commodity like gold. It has its limitations because you cannot create the amount uh, that you need to satisfy growth just like this, you know, you, you cannot mine gold indefinitely, yeah. Uh, okay, also, uh, you said that no country currently implemented uh, that kind of monetary system. No, no. For example, if we have a single country implementing it, uh, what would happen in a global scope with that country? Uh, this was discussed in the paper. Um, the conclusion was that from the outside, nothing would really change. Uh, this would just be another currency which uses uh, different rules uh, to create new units of exchange, but that's it. Apart from that, uh, the external uh, ex exchanges or, or transactions will not be affected. Okay, thank you. There was a question at the front. You can just yeah. get in front of the mic and... Okay. okay. I have a question. Like, uh, I didn't quite get uh, uh, what's the idea of uh, future and current state of cryptocurrencies because that's what I thought maybe part of the talk would be. Like, uh, what's, what's the idea according to you? I mean, like, how does it look like? Because every now and then there's new one and it's out of just... Uh, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on cryptocurrencies. Okay. But from reading news and various articles, um, I have learned that such currencies can be good for having spot, for facilitating spot transactions. That is, you need to transfer money somewhere. Uh, so you get in, you buy uh, a certain amount of Bitcoin that you need before the price has fluctuated too much, and then the person with your hands exchanges in, in, in his own currency. Uh, but uh, I have also read that people are making increasing usage of the blockchain feature of Bitcoin, which is this distributed ledger. Uh, for example, uh, there is an idea to use that uh, to, to create a, a, a registry for real estate in Greece, for, for instance. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah. Or for example, to create a ledger, um, distribute, distributed ledger for transactions, banking transactions. But this has more to do with the actual blockchain, uh, this, let's say, chain of hashes, than using this technology for, for payment, for facilitating payment okay. of currency. Last question, please. Okay, final question. Um, as you can read over there on your slides, uh, the uh, person or organization that controls the distribution of, uh, of this money has real power. At the, th the third point, no, forward. Yep. yep. Uh, so uh, this, this looks a bit suspicious to me. I mean, uh, does this uh, make the assumption that 
this organization, these people will be um, somehow good and they will not be corrupt and what happens if they are corrupted? And then the system also looks to me a little bit like at least uh, centralized, like, uh, you know, like, uh, one big power that controls and redistributes everything. It looks yeah. a little bit like communism, yeah, to be I, honest. I understand. Yeah, people have this concerns, like my friend, he has this concern. Yeah. Uh, how are we going to, tr I mean, do we trust governments to this, do this properly? Uh, one way if, uh, to, let's say, minimize the chance of corruption is to have very simple rules as to how this money is allocated. And one way to do that is to have a very simple principle, like, let's say, we are, let's say, a population of eight or seven million. So this new money that has to be created to satisfy GDP uh, growth, let's just distribute this money to everyone. Or, or alternatively, ju let's just decrease the taxes for everyone. What if they decide to, do, to distribute this money to themselves? Or maybe this well, is not well, this, impossible this, yeah, under yeah, the system. Yeah, these are people who, which you elect, uh, who you elect into government. Let's say, uh, okay, let's say there are two parties, like there is, for example, the Socialist Party, and let's say I vote for a Socialist Party. And if I vote for a Socialist Party, I want uh, p pensioners to, to get this money, right? And you're from the Reformatory, right? And their policy is more conservative, so they would want to decrease the taxes for everyone with this money. And let's say we don't get enough uh, votes to create a government, so we have to create a coalition, and let's say we'll decide, okay, 50% of this money will be used to increase pensions, and the other 50% will be used to reduce taxes. Thank you. Let's thank you again. Okay.